My name is Rob Pegler. I'm the Senior VP and CTO at Symbolic I.O., a company you may not have heard of uh, with good reason. This is the Emerging Technology Conference after all, right? So we are, we are definitely in the emerging stage. We're a 26-person startup. Uh, I was employee number 22, if you're counting. But uh, this is really interesting, and I'll spend about a half an hour, maybe a little more, uh, with you explaining not only what we do, but kind of why we do it, uh, what effect it might have uh, on you, and especially the applications that we all uh, are entrusted to run and maintain and take care of and drive the business forward, all that good stuff. Uh, just one slide on the company again, very short. Uh, our, our founder, Brian Ignamorello, a long time in the storage industry, as am I. I am entering, uh, dare I say it, my uh, 27th year, and that is hexadecimal, so you can do the calculation on that. Um, but uh, we are headquartered in Holmdel, New Jersey, in the original Bell Labs building. So if you know your history, that's a really interesting place where the transistor was invented. Uh, amongst many other things, where the background radiation of the universe was first discovered. Princeton's just down the road. But anyway, so it's a, it's a cool place to work. Uh, and if you know your Unix, this is where Unix actually started too with uh, Ken Thompson and Dennis Ritchie. God rest his soul. And we've done a lot of work. We've presented in front of quite a few people, especially in the financial services industry. New York City's 45 minutes up the road from us. Uh, and uh, we went out of stealth uh, just a few months ago. Uh, in May, and we are rapidly approaching the stage where we will deliver first product in a limited availability sense to the market. We don't want to go out there with you know 800,000 customers. A few is good, uh, but that's what we do. So really interesting technology, uh, highly valued, uh, lots of intellectual property. So you know what are the problems we're trying to solve? With as with all new technology, be it software or hardware, and we are actually a combination of both. We leverage new hardware technology, in particular what you and I know as persistent memory. Uh, this comes in the form today of NVDIMs, or non-volatile DIMs. Everybody knows what a DRAM DIM is. We all have them on our servers. Uh, but very few of us, I would think, have non-volatile DIMs in our servers. And that's part of our platform, as it turns out. Uh, because of this challenge, we all know the story here. We've lived in the world of data for, you know, low these many decades. Uh, and, you know, binary kind of is what it is, right? It's ones and zeros. And yes, there is math involved in this presentation. Uh, not much, but there is some because you have to understand, and you will. Uh, and everybody knows what compression and deduplication is. Again, not a new thing. We've been doing it for quite a while, uh, both up in a server, in a host, if you like, and also more recently down in a storage array. And I have background in storage arrays dating back to the early 90s. So this is, this is, again, not new stuff. And those are trying to solve a problem, right? Storage efficiency, if you like. Uh, but they work on very large quantities of data, right? 512 bytes, 4K bytes. And this is too much for CPUs to handle, right? CPU has to give up at that point and say, OK, I'm going to either try to read all this into my memory and calculate it all and write it all back out, or you know what, Mr. Storage Array, you go handle that, and I'll just take the bits coming off the channel. All right, so we've played that game now for the better part of 20 years. Right? And, it's, and it's a challenge, because as we all know, data isn't getting any smaller anytime soon. We all know this, and that's a good thing. All right, so if you're analyzing healthcare data, this is a good thing. Right? I want to be able to ingest and analyze more because this is a way for my company to do well. OK, so I would propose to you, and I am not a fluent Mandarin speaker by any means. Uh, I know enough to order a beer in Shanghai. That's pretty good. Piju, right? That's beer. Uh, but we have a Weiji on our hands. So those, that's the and those are the two Mandarin symbols, Wei and Ji, right? Now, most often, you hear this translated incorrectly, dangerous opportunity. Have you heard of that? We're at a dangerous opportunity, right? Well, that's not what it means. It means more like we're at a critical point, a Weiji, right? And I think we are. Well, why, you know, again, why is that? Well, because instead of treating data like, you know, we have for 60 years, are there different ways to treat incoming data, just binary, zeros and ones, right? And handle it differently to make it more efficient for storage purposes, because let's face it, we all, we all like our efficient storage, right? The cheaper, the better. The more bits we can pack in there, the better. That's all great. But we also like efficient compute. 
right? So we need to solve the way G. So how do you do that with raw binary, with ones and zeros? Well, lots and lots of techniques have been done in the past to try to do this. Again, compression, d duper, two of them. But what we do is solve it by using symbolic representation of the data, encoding, if you like. We take raw binary, 32 or 64-bit quantities, something a CPU can deal with, right, and encode it, form a marker, and then store the marker in persistent memory. So the markers turn out to be much shorter than the actual data, which is a good thing. And since I'm always in the memory channel, I don't have to persist to disk like a normal system would, right? If you know your Unix, the sync command is my favorite command of all time, right? It makes you feel good. The more you sync, the better you feel, right? Because I'm persisting all this metadata information down to somewhere where if, you know, God forbid the power goes off, I can come back, right? I don't lose data. Because in DRAM, guess what? It's volatile memory. You lose it. This is why many applications, OSs, hypervisors, file systems go to great lengths to protect their own memory space and make sure it's flushed to a persistent store at a periodic basis. Right? We have to do this, otherwise file systems would be no good. Right? So WayG is a symbolic representation of critical point. Now you and I in English, critical point is how many characters? Right? 13 8-bit letters, ASCII, and a blank. All right, so it takes 112 bits to store that as critical point with a blank in between. But if I translate it into Mandarin, it only takes two symbols, and I can represent both, both those symbols in 13 bits each, 26 bits. Now you pick. It means exactly the same thing. Your application understands it. Right? You store 26 bits or you store 114. It means the same thing. Right? Who, uh, some of you may remember a little diversion into history, right? World War II, the Navajo Code Talkers. Remember them? What was their mission? They had a specific mission. Something to do with communication. That's exactly right. So they were entrusted with doing secret communications amongst the Allies so that the Germans could not decode it or intercept it. So they spoke Navajo. And guess what? Germans didn't know how to translate Navajo. They didn't do it encrypted. They just spoke their native tongue, and the Germans never could understand it. This is literally why I'm not up here, you know, sprechen Sie Deutsch, right? Because that was very helpful. Now, the folks in Bletchley Park intercepted and decoded the German messages, which were encrypted, right? The Enigma machine. It was. It was modern. You know, Alan Turing, and that's, uh, go visit that in Bletchley Park. It's a 45-minute train ride north of London. It's fabulous history. But anyway, the Navajo did this without encryption. But it was encoded messages, right? We do a similar thing. We take raw binary, translate it, encode it, if you like, into bit markers that are non-understandable to anything but us, right? So literally, if you ripped the NVDIMS out of this thing and tried to take a look, you'd have gibberish on your hands. That's another aspect of this, right? And let's just say there are certain people in the government that are very interested in this stuff because of that characteristic, right? I mean, AES-256 is fun, but this is even more fun. So anyway, we need to change the game. We need to think about data differently because we know what the CPUs and the memory and the storage and the SSDs and NVMe, we know how all that behaves. The common denominator is data. All right, think about DNA. It's effectively ones and zeros because there's only A and T and C and G pairs. That's it. And you and I have much identical DNA with some differences in between. This is make us unique. Right? Well, if I was storing DNA patterns, I wouldn't store everybody's genome raw. I'd store the 99% once, and then I'd store the differences. Wouldn't you? Bingo. So the answer, again, computational defined storage. I don't want to store the data. You know, I'll store the encoding of it, but I want to compute the data. Because the CPUs are really good at that. If you give them 32 and 64 bits, we all learned this in programming, right? The CPUs are really fast and, and very efficient at doing that. Because I can take a blank register and fill it full of zeros in 500 picoseconds. Right? Two instructions per nanosecond. And that's on one core, times however many cores you have. So I can compute data extremely fast, right? If I have to go to the memory channel, it's a little less fast, but it's still in memory, and I've got a slide that shows you the differences between that. So this is the answer. Take, process the data computationally. 
use the CPUs, process the data, store the markers in the instructions on how to, if, if you like, reconstitute it. Right? Some people call it, you know, uh, I want, uh, it's like the Star Trek transporter, right? You, re you rematerialize all of a sudden in space, and that's a, that's a cool word, right? So you can rematerialize the data. Isn't that fun? Right? So, and the method of encoding gets better as you bring in more data. Now, why is that? Right? Well, if you remember, for example, Huffman encoding from school, right? The shortest marker represents a certain amount of data, right? And if I see that data more often, that certain pattern more, with more frequency, I might be able to get away with an even shorter marker to represent that, right? And the stuff I only see once in a bazillion times, uh, I could have a long marker for that, no problem. All right, so I want to encode the shortest marker to represent the most data. And this changes over time. You ingest new, we go back and rethink. Right? Again, this is like your body, DNA changing over time. Right? We all grow up, we mature, we change over time. Some of us get gray hair, others not. Right? Now, don't look too closely, you'll see that. But this, this, this is an interesting method. Right? And the more data you bring in, the more efficient it gets. Which is actually the reverse of some dedupe and compression engines. So that's, that's interesting. So what's the carrier? So all of this is software, right? Some of it is BIOS level stuff because we have to worry about persistent memory modules, right? We call them store modules, right? It's a nice name for them because they do store markers, right? And then the other thing is, you know, all of this is software and it has to engage closely with the CPUs, which again, they're really good at. I mean, you heard Steven's keynote today, the cores are very plentiful and they're relatively fast these days. The problem is the memory bandwidth in and out of those cores is quite limited. There's only four per socket. That's it, that's all you get in DDR4. And I, I worked for almost a year and a half at Micron. You learn that lesson really quickly when you make memory. Right? That's the choke point in today's systems. Used to be the storage. Now we have relatively fast storage down the bus. Right, so the question is, how much can I get into memory so I can start analyzing, start computing? Right, and that's the choke point. So this is the, you know, Doc, it hurts when I do that. Don't do that. Right, so stop shoveling, you know, memory or bits from disk into memory. Keep in memory and hold it there. Right, never let it go. This is a wonderful thing. And if you encode it down to short markers, you get to hold much more data in memory than before. Orders of magnitude. Right, it's really interesting. So IRIS is a server, in, uh, intens uh, Intensified RAM Intelligent Server, I-R-I-S, get it? And it has a nice IRIS looking I in the front, as it turns out. Right, so we had to instantiate this software on something. At first, we picked a storage array. Four years ago, we thought we were going to do a storage array, right, because of all the encoding, and it would have been great, right? But we quickly realized that we could do that perfectly, and yet we were still hamstrung by the overheads of SCSI and moving data up the channel and CPU interrupts and all that. Inefficient computing, which, by the way, we've been doing for five decades now, right? So different flavors of Iris. This is the one that's interesting, right, with SimCE, which is our software. That is enabled in Vault that gives you this really interesting encoding. And then store, which is actually a server with disk, and we use, for example, NVMe disks, very popular today. My former company makes some very nice ones, and we use them as second or third tier storage. Because right? if you have an application that still wants to read and write a volume, you can read and write persistent memory through us, with no change to your app, by the way, or you can read and write to a disk, right? just like you do today on any server. That's perfectly fine. Right? But it's much, much slower than actually doing it in and out of persistent memory. That's interesting. OK, so how does it work? Again, we leverage the CPUs as data comes in. It's either generated by a CPU. Your application is spitting out data, right? And hopefully, it's going to persist it somewhere, enter file systems, right? Or perhaps raw volumes, if you're still doing that, or a network. Those are the most common ways to get data into a CPU. You can read it from network. You can read it from disk, or you can generate it through an app, a set of CPU instructions. Right? Either way, you've got to persist all this stuff at the end of the day, or otherwise you're going to lose it. That's no fun. Right? So we do all this. I'm not going to walk you through the entire thing. I'd be happy to whiteboard it for you out in the hall. Uh, so we don't store the data. We write the method into memory. I want to write the marker and the way to decode it into memory, because I can hold that in far less space than the actual 
data, right? Uh, let's, let's face it, 64 bits, right? Common register these days, right? What, what does the number five look like to the CPU in 64 bits? It looks like, looks like 61 bits, 101, right? So that's 64 bits, 61 plus 3, right? There is math involved, right? Why do we store 61 zeros? Don't have to. We can compute 61 zeros much faster than I can read 61 zeros from any media, including DRAM, All right? Because again, this is running at CPU speeds. 2 gigahertz CPU means per core, I can do two instructions in one nanosecond per core times the number of cores you have. I get a lot done in a nanosecond, as it turns out, right? Which is a little bitty amount of time. So this is interesting, because if I have to go fetch those 61 bits from disk, now I'm at microsecond or, God forbid, millisecond latencies. That's either 1,000 or 1 million times slower. All right? And we've been dealing with that, you know, God love it, storage erase all day, but you know, 1 million times slower than a CPU. So go figure. So don't store the data, compute the data, all right? Here's a little block diagram for you. If you can live up here, this is where the action is. Because at the end of the day, you're not analyzing anything until you get to the CPU. You know, you're storing a lot of stuff here. It's all great, right? By the way, this doesn't go away. Again, if you want Iris to communicate to block level storage all day long, right? Normal Linux type stuff. You're doing it today. No problem, right? This might be NVMe. We use it for tier two, right? This might be SAS or SATA SSD. Either blank inserted into the iris, it's just a server, you know, holds 24 disks, right? Or a storage array down a channel of some form. Fiber channel, iSCSI, and now PCIe NVMe direct fabric, which some vendors are starting to offer. Which, and that's all great, wonderful, right? But this is where the work gets done. CPUs and memory, right? You can't break that equation, CPUs and memory. Because if it's not here, the CPU can't see it, right? CPUs cannot see directly into these devices. That's what the bus is for. CPU gives up, says, oh, crap, i got to send a message down the bus. I'll wait for it to come back. Meanwhile, I'll try to do something else. And the interrupt flag goes, I'm done, right? Do you understand how many times a second that happens? Some of you do, right? Linux kernel context switch time, three microseconds. Three microseconds. All right, so I'm doing 300 million a second at rate. All right, well, how about no context switches? Let's just keep computing. Send no interrupts. This is a wonderful thing, I have to tell you, because you waste a lot of time doing interrupts. All right, now, we have to deal with user data. No question about it, right? So what are storage arrays really good at these days? Well, things, you know, snapshot and replication and different forms of copy, different forms of backup. This is all part and parcel of arrays and you have to do it, right? So we do, we have this interesting thing called Blink. It's, a, it's actually a trademark name. And if I take a Blink of an iris, not only do I capture all the data in an iris, remember markers and instructors, right? But also the entire configuration of the whole machine. So all the DNS stuff, all the IP addresses, all the you know, parameters on the network interface cards, the NICs, all the memory configuration, the entire machine's metadata is stored in a blink plus the markers, all right? So it, it effectively doesn't snapshot volumes. We're always used to snapshotting data volumes, right? Good thing, right? But how about taking the entire machine as a snap, effectively taking that image of a machine, completely containing it, and by the way, the space to do it is very small because I'm not snapping user data raw, snapping markers. Yes, sir. Yes, so, so keep thinking that, you, you bet. No, no, that's very good. So a store module is the persistent memory piece. This is DRAM, right? See if you've got to have DRAM. This is a store module, right? You can think of this as an NVDIMM-N, half DRAM, half NAND, right? It's persistent memory by definition. Because anything I write into here in the DRAM side gets persistent in the NAND on power loss, right? Now, this could be some other form of, to Tom's point, some other form of non-volatile or persistent memory, 
Crosspoint is the one making the most waves out there on the market. And again, having come from Micron, I could tell you all sorts of stuff about that, but I can't because I'm under NDA. So I won't. Right? But this could be pretty much anything. We happen to implement it in NVDIMS today as persistent memory because A, we can, and B, the state of the art is starting to advance on those. We are arguably leading. I don't know if any of you have servers deployed with NVDIMS today. I'm guessing not. And if you are, I'm going to buy an adult beverage later on. Because right? there's only two motherboard manufacturers that support HP and Supermicro. That's it. Nobody else has announced support. Not Dell, not Quanta, not any, YWIN, nobody. Right? And we are about a year ahead, so Intel tells us, right, on this technology. But this could be, to Tom's point, this could be anything persistent. But it's got to sit in the memory channel. Disks, great, all day long. Pick what you want. Right? But up here, because this, this is the CPU's world. That's it. It knows nothing about what's going on in here, and frankly, it doesn't care, and it's way too slow anyway, for the CPU's point of view. So again, blink, because we have to do snapshots and clones, right? So data, data cloning, have to do that. People expect us to do it, and we do. Uh, and we do it in seconds, because we clone markers. We don't clone raw data, so the markers are very efficient. It takes a lot less time. And consistency in groups and replication, taking these blinks and blasting them out over a cluster of different iris, which might have some of the markers already, the same markers, right? So you don't have to replicate the same marker twice, just what's different. That's an interesting technique. I could spend another hour just talking about this by itself and the implications on cloud computing, but I won't. So again, part two, and lots of our companies are involved in searching data, in analyzing it, maybe doing indexing, things like that, you know, taking unstructured data. Maybe you're running Apache Spark or some other relatively common analytic tool. Maybe you're still doing relational database. Nothing wrong with that. SQL Server, Oracle 12C, all day long, right? But you have to search raw binary data at the end of the day. These are what the algorithms are designed to do. Well, imagine instead of searching 64 bits, search a little bitty bit string that represents a marker and finding where you are at CPU speeds. This gets really interesting in a big hurry. So there's a lot of search algorithms which work really well in this architecture. Again, yet another reason why our friends at the federal government is, are interested in this kind of stuff, because they're trying to find people, right? And I'll just leave it there. But lots of, again, lots of patents around this and full data tiering, right? The first tier is our store module. That's persistent memory, right? We call them store modules. And they are, because that's literally, they're a module in a server that stores data, right? And then tier two, you, that, that, I mean, it's a server. It has, uh, you know, PCIe slots, Gen 3. You can put, use half height half link cards in there. You can use U.2. You can use, pick your SSD. You can even put rotating in here if you want. But if you do, oh boy, please don't. Use SSDs, right? Just saying, right? And again, it's, it's a server. This is also an interesting, you know, business point because when you approach, and I used to work for three-letter storage array companies, and, and nothing wrong with that. They make great stuff, right? But it's a relatively expensive purchase. Let's face it, six and seven figures, right? Difficult to sell. Took a long time, right? Now, servers? Servers are kind of garden variety, right? I'll bet you your, your procurement people can deal with servers a lot easier than they can buy big honking storage arrays, right? Much easier to consume. Right, because everybody loves their servers and their compute engines, which is exactly what we do. Right? Yes, we store lots and lots of data, many terabytes worth of it, but we don't necessarily use disk to do it. That's a great thing. So yeah, we have lots and lots of patents. We have very smart people at this company. Uh, and then again, there's Blink. Right? Again, a complete infrastructure backup. So if I had an iris here, and in two months I, I probably will, right? which is very cool, but the whole infrastructure, I could take that iris and blink it, put the blink on a USB stick, walk it over to the iris down the hall, put that USB stick in and restore the blink. And that machine is exactly the same as the one I took the blink from. I mean, exactly. All the IP addresses, all the configuration, everything is the same, including the data. All right? So imagine, you heard Steve talk about containers. Right? Imagine doing that, spinning up containers, spinning down containers, but doing it at the entire machine level. This is effectively what a blink is. So that you just turn that 
uh, doesn't need to, yeah. right? It, it needs to have some store modules so I can restore the markers. Yeah. Store mod that's a good one. Yeah. Right. But other than that, let's say if I blink a machine with four nicks and I restore the blink in only two, I'll use yeah. the two. Oh, it's, I'm, it's not going to insist, oh, you've got to have four. You don't have to have identical. That's the whole point. That's exactly right. That's the whole point. All right, so this is literally cloning machines, if you like. Uh, yep. Sure. That's, that's a good point, and the answer is the latter. We have the entire machine. So, you know, effectively, we are a kernel module, right? So we are part of the OS, right? And it's, it's a very familiar Linux environment, so things like KVM, people are familiar with that. We can actually import a VMware virtual machine into this environment. The hypervisor is actually built in. You don't have to pay a license for it, which is another wonderful thing. But the answer is the latter, Mark, that the entire, you know, the OS configuration, all of that data is captured into Blink. Yeah, Tom. Sure. You could very well do that, absolutely, sure. Could very well be. Again, we have no, no problem. Again, uh, think of a normal Linux kernel. There's lots of fiber channel HPA support. There's lots of NIC support. You can go to town on that, and we recognize all of it. But where we enter the picture, again, is that store module, and what happens when that network brings in data into a buffer, which ends up in the kernel, because the kernel has to look at it, right, before it sends it up, up to the app or dispatches it off to a process or what. That's the point where we come in. Yep. Right. Yep. Well, I, I, that's, a, that's a fair point, Tom, and I, I'd say some of it does. Uh, you know, I don't, uh, we're not at the day where we will see petabyte scale data inside a server, no question about it. But will we see terabyte and tens of terabyte scale? You bet we will. Yeah. Absolutely. And we're seeing that today, as it turns out. Right. Now, here's, here's the interesting thing is I just want to take a more, couple minutes. So, yeah, this is all great. And, you know, again, for, for an old storage guy like me, this is wonderful because compute's really where it's at. I actually moved up here. I lived in the cities for 17 years. I, I moved up here to write operating system code for control data supercomputers. So HPC is really my original background. And I wrote code for a living for 20 years. Now I let the younger guys write code. It's cool. Right. So what, this is the so what question, right? So all this really interesting stuff, so what? What are the customers doing? Well, again, we're out of stealth, not in production yet, but we do have some customers. Here's one of them. They're a telco in New York. Typical telco. They have massive relational databases. Their engine of choice is SQL Server, uh, 2012, as it turns out. And they had a very large IBM deployment, right? IBM Blade Center, lots of CPUs, lots of RAM. Uh, IBM uh, store-wise storage, you know, classic storage array. They call it store there, there you go. You call it what you want, but that's what they had, and it ran their SQL Server workload, and it cost them about 800 grand to put all this together, fiber channel fabric, the whole nine yards, relative, again, six-figure spend, right? Nothing wrong with it. They allocated, they had, they run in virtual machines, they allocated 16 cores to the SQL Server virtual instance and 80 gigs of RAM you know, virtual RAM, right? So 16 and 80, remember that, right? So we went in with an IRIS, one, solamente uno, right? Running Vault and the hypervisor, so they took that virtual machine, Windows Server 2012, put it over on the IRIS, very simple, right? Fired up the hypervisor, and they asked, well, how many cores and how much RAM? And we said, give it four cores and four gigs of RAM. Now, you call Microsoft and ask them, about SQL Server 2012 and what the recommended hardware configuration is. If you tell them this, they will A, laugh, 
and then they will be say, you're no longer under support, it can't run. Well, I agree, with normal binary data, it can't, right? Because what's the big thing inside of databases that holds data? It's a buffer cache, right? Every single database on the planet has this because they want to preload data from disk into buffer cache, memory, so the CPU can do its thing. Queries and joins and inserts and all the other database, because you have to. You can't do a join on disk. You have to do join in memory and then flush it to disk. That's how it works. So we did all this, and it's 80K, by the way. That's a basic iris cost. So order, order of magnitude, less expense, number one. And here's the result. Right, so they did this huge, you know, nightly, right? Again, they're a telco. They had 40 million rows that they have to suck in. They do this big query, multiple joins. And if you're a database person, you know, this is not easy stuff, right? Now, if they, in normal, fetching everything from disk in that big IBM kit, 16 cores, 80 gigs of RAM, took 14 minutes or so. Because, I mean, they're fetching a lot of rows. Many, many hundreds of gigabytes of data coming in, right? Many. And it takes a while. You know, you can calculate the speed on, you know, your disk fetching from disk. If you have a really fast NVMe disk, you might read three gig a second terminal velocity, right? They have many hundreds of gigs, and by no means is this NVMe stuff, right? So they did all that, 14 minutes. They put it on the iris, four cores, four gigs of RAM, 40 million rows, right, with a LEM. That's our equivalent of a LUN, if you like, right? And consistently, it took two to three seconds. Same query. Same virtual machine. Windows 2012, SQL Server 2012, right? Read it all here. I'm happy to, you know, you can talk to this customer if you want. This is customer number one. Right? We have two and three coming up. But this is, you know, he was dumbfounded, number one, right? Because imagine the savings, not, ju not just on hardware, but on software, right? Of VMware users, anybody? I like my VMware plenty, but how much per socket do they charge you? about 2,500 bucks a socket, right? So if, if, if I have fewer sockets, I win. And then, uh, anybody run vSAN? Cool, I run vSAN at home, right? Uh, per socket, uh, about another three grand, right? So this again, doc, it hurts when I don't, uh, don't do that. If I don't have to pay those licenses, this is on top of the 800 versus 80 argument, right? So those are real results from a real customer who thought it was dumbfounded. Now, we told him, just to tweak it a little bit, we said go down to one gig and one core. One gig and one core, see what happens. Well, he did and it ran, it took about three minutes to run the query in one gig and one core, as opposed to 14 minutes for that. Now we said, yeah, you know, you don't have to do that. You know, four and four is fine, that's plenty, but uh, you see, this is what happens when you change the data. Because it's the same CPUs either way. So anyway, this was their result. Reduced CPUs by two-thirds, reduced memory by 95%, reduced read and write latency by night, a ridiculous number, 950%, almost three orders of magnitude. Ridiculous. Because if you stay in that world of the CPU, things get really interesting in a hurry. Right? And for them, this is monetization of their data. They do that query in two or three seconds, right? Instead of many minutes, right? And it represents customer data. Uh, that helps a lot. That helps a lot. So, I, again, I'll, I'm, I'm out in the exhibit area, happy to chat with you. I want to leave some time for the next speaker, too. So, hope this was interesting. I know it's kind of a fire hose, but it's emerging technology conference, right? So, you get what you asked for. Well, you know, uh, storing symbols representing the data symbolically, right? And the, by the way, this is not a fish or anything. This is an Egyptian glyph. Go figure, right? That the, the founder likes and representing, you know, like hieroglyphics, right? Symbolic representation of data. There you go. So now you know.